assist on that. That was wonderful. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. I come rested and refreshed. I have many stories to tell, but we'll take our time in telling them. We find ourselves today in Isaiah. The prophet speaks the second chapter, the first verse through the fifth verse. Hear these words. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, said concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thus. <coughs> Ever quicken God, as I speak, may you increase. And I decrease. May the words you have given me for this message be seeds that rest in our hearts that we might bear fruit for you here on earth. May I be bold and courageous in speaking what it is you've given me to speak. And may we as your people have ears that hear. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you give me a picture, please? They said, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. The mountain of greatest mountain. Now, that's an iPhone picture of Mary and my views for eight days. Off the front porch, it was the highest mountain in the land. And we could sit, although it was too cold to sit on the front porch, we could stand at the front door and look out the window. We could look out our living room window, and there was the mountain of God. The mountain of God will be established among all mountains. Can you imagine what it must feel like to wake up every morning and to breathe the frigid cold air, but yet to see the mountain of God? How could anything ever go wrong in a picture like that, with a view like that? Everything must have been perfect. It was eight days, 24 hours a day, every second of every day. Mary and I were together. Married people, think about that. <laughs> Sequestered in a cabin that was about 750 square feet, we had decided we were going to spend time together, and our view was the mountain of God. I wonder when we come into this Advent season if our view is on the mountain of God. If our view is intent upon being purposeful about being with the one we love and the one we are with. If we have decided that for every second of every day, if we are going to be about God, if we are going to remember that view, if we're going to remember our relationship with Jesus, if we're going to remember what the prophet of Isaiah said, that he will declare his mountain greatest among all mountains, and the people will come to it praising God. Thank you, Alan. We can come to that mountain. We can come and stay at that mountain as we enter the season of Advent. And we can focus ourselves on the coming of the Christ. That's what Advent means. The coming of Christ. Christ was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. It's time for us to come unto the season of God and feast upon what it is God is providing for us. But I wonder, did you notice something? Did you notice something in that picture? Did you look real good at that picture? 
It's a beautiful picture of a beautiful range of mountains. They span 14,000 feet up in the air. They're gorgeous. But right at the bottom of that picture, there's an electrical box. <laughs> it ruins the picture. Because for some reason in my trained eye, I would forget to look beyond the electrical box. I would get up in the morning and I would see the electrical box and the Lord was asking me to cast my vision further. The Lord's asking us to come into Advent to not focus on the material things of our lives, to not focus on the humanistic nature of ourselves, but to get focused on the mountain of God, which is greater than all mountains, which is where God will speak from and where God will move from. If you know the history of God, you know God, you know God moves among the mountains. So we are called this, this Advent season to collect ourselves, to check our vision. Anybody had your vision checked lately? Can you see this? Can you see that? Can you see this? Can you see that? Can you see this? Right? Both eyes. Can you see this? I recently went through a, a vision check, and it was like, hey, my right eye's blind, dude. I can't see that. Can you see this? Can you see that? He kept asking me the same question. Can you see this? As he did with the left side. I'm like, dude, I cannot see anything but the big E. Can you see this? Can you see that? Is it blurry? Is it perfect? But maybe we need to ask ourselves those questions. Are we focused on the mountain of God? Are we so nearsighted in our faith that all we can focus on is the electrical box in the picture? I tried and tried and tried to take that picture where you could see it good and the electrical box wouldn't be in it. Every time. It just was distorted if I raised it up too high. The mountain looked like a hill. It didn't look like a mountain. But I think it's because God wants us to understand that in our human nature, God is with us. The electrical box was small. It had very little detail. It was square. It was gray. It was on two landscape timbers buried in front of our cabin, put on, put on the, the post in front of our cabin. But the grandeur of that mountain was so great, it just enveloped that electrical box. And I wonder if when we're checking our vision this Advent season, if we're able to understand that God is in the small things of our lives, but he's so much greater than that. That we don't need to be focused on the little bitty things of our lives, that God is even greater than that. That God has made promises that he will take care of us and he will see to it that the Messiah will come and that we'll be, we'll be made new and that, that nation will not rise above nation. I, I read that text and I almost weep because I... I long for that day. I long for the day when humanity doesn't judge one another. I long for the day when war stops. Because the reason that the prophet mentions that is that war is exactly the opposite of what God wants. God wants shalom. And some people say, oh yeah, that, that means peace. Right? Make love, not war, right? Peace. That's where our tie-dye shirts with the peace in them on. <clears throat> That's not what that means. Shalom means that we as human beings recognize that it is God who created us. And that in every human being we want to judge, God's hand is on that human being. That that mighty mountain way overcomes the small attitude that we have. The small judgment that we have. The small declaration of power over somebody or, or indifference with somebody. That, that grandeur of mountain way overwhelms that. That we're not supposed to be the, the judges. We're supposed to be the ones who build the community of faith to where we, we can live in peace and harmony. What, what's the theme of the Christmas season? It's about peace. It's about being in peace with one another. It's about loving one another. It's about forgiving one another. It's about focusing on the Christ who came to do the hard work for us. And we're called in the Advent season to prepare ourselves. It's with hope. That's what this week's theme is. It's, hope. it's with hope that we gather. It's with hope that we come to God. It's, it's with hope that we have a relationship with Jesus to love on us. Now, I can't tell you that we spent every minute of those eight days in that cabin. I had this great idea <laughs> that we were going to go fishing. <laughs> now, Mama was just going to sit and Daddy was going to fish, right? Because, you know, us men, we got to get our manly things done. Mm. It was two degrees outside. <laughs> and 
And I used to have a house in the mountains and I knew every little fishing hole. You want to know what those fishing holes looked like when I decided to venture out and go see the fishing holes? Solid ice. So it meant I got back in the truck and Mary and I spent more minutes together. And we made a journey to a little mountain town called Taos, New Mexico. And we decided that we were going to go into a movie theater. Now, I haven't been in a movie theater in years. I mean, I'm serious. Netflix works for me, so I just don't go to the movie theater. <laughs> for me, it's too expensive to go and do it. But we did it all. We walked in, we bought coats, we bought the tubs of popcorn. <laughs> we walked in there, and you know what? Those chairs were climbing nowadays. <laughs> it was so cool, man. I was like, oh, yeah, we're going to stay here for a while. And we went and saw this movie. Two of my favorite actors, George Clooney and Julia Roberts. We watched The Ticket to Paradise. And it is, if you haven't been, especially if you've been married for any time at all, please go see this movie. It is a wonderful movie. You will laugh from your toes. And it's, there, were, there were four people in the theater, me and Mary and another two ladies. And I catch those two ladies every once in a while looking over at me because I'm laughing so hard. I mean, I'm in the floor laughing. But it's a beautiful story about a young girl who graduates from law schools and goes to Bali to celebrate with her best friend. And she's on this tour. And she, they're diving, and she gets left. They're out snorkeling, and the boat leaves her and her friend out in the ocean. And, of course, this young man who farms seaweed, who's good-looking, Polynesian young man, comes to the rescue and brings them to shore. And mom and dad, who are divorced, get this letter from Lily, their daughter, that says, I'm staying on Bali, I've fallen in love, and I'm getting married. Now, this is the young lady who's supposed to graduate with honors from law school, come home and be an attorney and all the things they've been preparing for all their lives. And she's all of a sudden, forget that, 37 days on this island says, I'm going to marry this man. Now, David, who is George Clooney, and Georgia, who is Julia Roberts, they have a relationship that does not mesh. They were once married, but they <laughs> each other. I mean, hate each other. They can't say a kind word. Everything they weren't says cuts one another down. They always want to be the best parent. They, they argue in front of Lily at her graduation. They just, you know, I love you. Nope, I love you more. I'm proud of you. Nope, I'm proud of you more. I'm the one who made you. No, you didn't. No, I'm... And they say these things. And they decide they're going to sabotage the wedding. Instead of bringing peace and joy and love, because it's outside their picture of understanding of what they think their daughter ought to be doing, they decide they're going to come together and form a truce with one another, and they're going to go and make this wedding not happen. Do we do that to God? God gives us plans in our lives, and God gives us things in our lives to go and do, and we decide we're going to make it work out for us, and we're going to sabotage what it is God has planned. That we're going to go and we're going to, we're going to go against the ways of the Lord. And what, we're going to continue to fight with one another and war with one another. And we're going, to, we're going to keep breeding that dysfunction. Because all I can think about when they were, they were trying to be deceitful, they stole the wedding rings. I mean, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. But they stole the wedding rings and they did set other things to circumvent this marriage. And it made me think about what do we do to circumvent our relationship with God? It's the season of Advent. When we're supposed to come together with all of our flaws, or maybe just me, but we're supposed to all come together with all of our flaws and come before God and say, thank you, God. And we're supposed to feast in, in the house of bread in Bethlehem. We're supposed to feast upon the bread of life in Christ Jesus and come to know God more intimately and more closely. Because you see, there's a theme in the Balinesian, in the Balinesian culture when they get married, they say there is a time, a place, the right place, the right time, and the right person for a marriage to happen. And they can go through all this chaos. All this chaos. And David and Georgia come to the understanding that maybe this isn't the right person. Or maybe it's not the right place. Or maybe it's not the right time. And they, they, they infuse this thought process into Gidi, who is the groom. That maybe she's not the right person. She's going she's gonna to eventually wake up one of these days and wish she was back in the United States being an attorney in the United States. But his family, it's huge. I mean, huge. 
And their culture envelops them. And they begin to love on them. And they, they accept them even in spite of their flaws. And they, they welcome them to the wedding. And all that they've done, whether they've hid the rings, they've done some other things to circumvent the, the marriage, the whole Polynesian family, they gather them up and they wrap them up and they bring them to the wedding. And they love on David and Georgie. They love on them. And, and even as the wedding's taking place, the last event of the wedding is they take this sword and they stick it through this leaf and it's a committal of life for, for the Polynesian couple. And right when Gidi's fixing to do that, he stops. And they've been through all this chaos. And he says, I know she's the right person. And I know this is the right time. And I know this is the right place. But he turns and he faces David, who is Lily's husband, I mean Lily's dad, and he says to him, David, we need you and Georgia's real blessing before we can finish this. I mean, all those plans, all the things they've done, they need the blessing from the father, from the mother, to say that, yes, we honor this couple in this place, in this time, and in these people. We honor them. Now, you can imagine the chaotic look on David and George's face. They're, they're sitting by one another at the wedding, and all they've done is argue the whole time and try to be deceitful and disrupt this wedding. And this young, mature man stops and says, hey, we're not doing it unless you bless him. George Clooney's hilarious. He stands up and he stutters and hymns and hauls. And, and I just love him, especially since he's aged. I just love him. And he, he finally finds the words to say to Georgia and him give their blessing to the young couple. And they're married. And they take the sword and they drive it through the leaf and the celebration begins. I wonder this Advent season, are we going to give our blessing to God so that we can be blessed? Do we understand that how we accept the Christ is how we reflect the Christ to others? It's in our, if, if we continue to make war with one another, we continue to, to spread that throughout the world. You know, one of the things we talk about at Christmas is being an instrument of peace. Are we? It says in the scriptures that they will take their swords and beat them into plowshares. And they will take their spears and beat them into pruning hooks. I wonder, do we understand what that means? There's a man who once said, took that term of Isaiah's and he translated it into modern terms so we would understand it. And what he said was, we'll take our howitzer tanks and we'll turn them into John Deere tractors and plow the fields. We'll take our rifles and we'll stick them in the ground and they'll form a fence where the, the grapevines can grow and we can feed people. In fact, we'll take our missile silos and we'll turn them into wheat silos so we can store the ground. And we'll take the Pentagon and we'll turn it into the largest food court the world has ever seen. That's what it means to become an instrument of peace. That's what it means for us to find that time and that place and the right people and to take what it is God has given us and not to declare war on humanity, but to be instruments of peace, to transition what the world tries to give us and form it in the way that Christ was formed, through God's hands, so that we can be people full of the Spirit and establish peace on earth, that we can give our blessing to those we come encounter with, so that we can walk with one. We're just beginning the Advent season. And it's a call into accountability. It's a call into reflection, which leads to celebration. I hope this Advent season that you find the right person, that you find the right time, and you find the right place to celebrate God. Celebration was over and the kids were headed off for their honeymoon celebrations. And it was time for David and Georgia to push off and to leave Bali and get on the boat. And they had to sit by one another on the boat. Their truce was still kind of in place, but not really. They had had some good moments and they had had some horrible moments. And as the boat was drifting back, David looked at Georgie. 
Georgia looked at me. And they said these words. Right time? Yeah. Right place? Yeah. And then they asked the question. Right person? These people who have been divorced for 20 years and have hated each other and have done everything they can to destroy one another had come together on this island to understand that originally God was right. That God had put them together. And they were good for each other. And in that moment, they made a move, a commitment that was one of the greatest parts of the show. The boat's drifting off. They're sitting. It's like a big pontoon boat. And they're sitting up front on it on a bench. And the boat's drifting off into the coastline. And simultaneously, when they ask the question right person, they run together. They get up and they run together and they launch themselves in midair off the boat towards the island. And the movie ends. Mary loved it. Romantic comedy ends just perfect. Could have been a Hallmark movie. But what it said to me was I wonder where we are now. If we understand who the person is. If we understand what the time is. And if we understand where the place is. The person is Jesus. Time is now, and the place is here. O oh, people of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen, amen. and amen.